Hi, um, welcome to this evening's uh, parent program. I'm really excited to welcome you to our program, The Search for Identity and Freedom from Expectations. I'm Beth Ann Sinelli, Executive Director of Communities That Care of Greater Downingtown. And we're very excited that you've joined us for um, this parent speaker program this evening, along with our Downingtown Area School District, um, with Sarah Brooks, who's joining us this evening from the district, and also Kim Porter from Be a Part of the Conversation. And CTC works really closely with Be a Part of the Conversation and, of course, with the Downingtown Area School District. And we're also very excited for our panelists who are joining us this evening to present and also be available to answer questions um, that you may have about this evening's topic. So um, we will get started so that we can um, begin the program and be mindful of everybody's evening. And I'd like to introduce Kim Porter um, from Be a Part of the Conversation. Thank you so much, Beth Ann. It's great to be with you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to uh, the Department of Drug and Alcohol Services at Chester County. They are funding this program and love partnering with all of you at Downington, Downingtown Area School District and Communities That Care for Greater Downingtown. Thank you very, very much. Um, you're also gonna be hearing from Kate Roberts tonight. She's a therapist who is a um, licensed marriage and family therapist. She's gonna be sharing after my presentation. You're also gonna hear from Sarah Brooks, Brooks as Beth Ann mentioned, who is the student assistant specialist at the district. Um, we're also gonna have with us an alum of Downingtown Area School District named Kayla. She's gonna be sharing a bit of her story and how um, her story relates to this topic of identity that we have for you tonight. Um, we also have Chrissy Diesenbach, Jimbowski with us tonight. Sorry, Chrissy, um, who is also from the uh, Downingtown area communities that care. So let's get started. All right. First of all, reminder, we have a survey that pops up at the end of this. We are so grateful for you to take just a few moments to complete this survey. It helps us to know if this was helpful, if there is um, any, if there are topics you would like us to address in the future. We do take a look at these surveys and really rely on feedback to know what we need to be doing differently, what you'd like to hear in, in the future and so on. Okay, so tonight's topic covers um, a lot of different things that we could easily spend an evening on each and every one of these, um, but we really are generalizing this and talking about identity. Um, identity, not necessarily as a good or a bad thing, but just something that we know that young people might be struggling with a little bit, or might be even feeling the pressure of what their identity is or how they've been labeled, so to speak. More on that in a bit. But these are the different areas, and I'm going to kind of break them down and talk about them individually. But all of these areas are places that we've identified, and as our organization, Be a Part of the Conversation, focuses on substance use, misuse, addiction, but we know that a lot of these things can be um, just kind of go in concert with the struggles that young people have in some of these areas. So perfectionists and high achievers, um, you know, it's great to be ambitious. It's great to be competitive and all of that, but we also worry that how important that is to that person and the pressure they might be feeling, even self-imposed pressure um, to, to succeed, to excel, um, to do as well as, if not better than their peers, um, and what might contributing factors lead to their wanting to either escape from some of these, um, these are some of the traits that you might find in somebody who is very much a perfectionist. Um, would they want to maybe numb themselves because they're feeling overwhelmed? Would they want to um, if they're prescribed something for um, ADHD, for example, which is an amphetamine, Adderall, Vyvanse, those sorts of things are um, substances of, of misuse sometimes. And so might someone even who's not diagnosed with ADHD um, start to use these substances to you know, focus better. It's called the study drug when they get off to college. And I will share with you that I'm a person um, who has a, a son in recovery from addiction. He does not have ADHD, but he was absolutely misusing Adderall. He was in college um, just to em enhance his, his ability to study and stay up late and all of that. It did not work out well for him at all. It was too much of a rush for him, but um, it, it just led to a lot of other substance use. But this was just a thing that he thought was a normal thing that college students did. Um, and wanting to succeed. 
So let's talk a little bit about the LGBTQ2IA plus population and just to kind of break down some terms a little bit. So these are the, the um, populations that are identified in what you see as that LGBTQ2IA plus. They can refer to sexual, sexual orientation. In some cases, they refer to a gender identity. And in some cases, it's, it might be both and for some folks, but here's just some basic definitions of sexual orientation as opposed to gender identity. They are, they are different and we wanna help, help make that clear. And when we think about um, particularly gender norms, you know, this is kind of traditionally what we've seen, what we may have been, this is probably not our kids' generations, but maybe parents um, who are kind of accustomed to these gender norms that are out there. You know, what we expect and when what, what society or our culture has expected out of gender norms. And this is just not always the case for people, obviously. And so um, being LGBTQ2I plus is not in and of itself a risk factor for substance use or addiction. However, it does come with some other things like there's unfortunately, there can be some shaming, some bullying, homophobia, even within the family. Um, this can be very, very challenging for folks. Um, and it challenges these, this population. And again, when you've experienced some of these emotions that come with it, there might be an inclination to use substances to kind of take yourself out of those feelings. We do know studies have shown us that um, these populations, especially adolescents, are more likely to binge drink, use cannabis, engage in um, intravenous drug use, or use cocaine, um, much more so than their non-LGBT peers. Uh, we have, I think, some very good news in that when you look at the different generations here that are broken down, here's the silent generation, boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z, um, if they look at Gen Z, who are currently nine to 24 years old, if you think about it, their parents are probably Gen X. So you can see there's a pretty big disparity of folks who um, know someone who prefers gender neutral pronouns, for one thing, such as they, they, or them. Um, and there are also is going to be some disparity in those who um, um, believe that forms should, should include options other than the traditional gender norms, which is man or woman. So you can see that over the over time, there's been a shift in belief in change and understanding of recognizing these pro, these uh, gender neutral pro, pronouns. But also, just look at this four year period. The change in um, the number of the percentage of 15 to 17 year olds who said that they identified as non heterosexual. So this is great news, I think, because people are feeling much less um, inhibited about expressing their, their identity. Um, so we are seeing a shift in this. And uh, certainly with our young people, we are. And by the way, I should have mentioned that if you're worried about capturing any of these images, we are recording this program. Um, any questions that you ask as we go throughout using the chat or the Q&A will not be visible on the recording, but please feel free to submit those questions and we'll, we'll get to those a little later on in the Q&A. But also I'll be posting this slide deck. So any of the stuff that you wanna take a deeper dive into will be available to you later. Okay. Athletes, this is another population we're gonna talk about. So it is great to be involved in extracurricular activities. And as parents, of course, we love to believe that this is a great way for our kids to protect themselves from um, substance using behaviors, you know, engaging in those kinds of things. Um, unfortunately, it's also can be a risk factor. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, any involvement can be a protective factor like this, but, um, there are some possibilities that they're going to have a different personality that might make them more of a risk taker, make them feel a bit invincible, thrill seeking, and these peer norms, right? So if somebody on my team or my club or whatever their organization is, or especially in athletics, they, they just might feel like they want to be a part of that. They want to be included. Um, that's, this is as old as time, all of us talking about peer pressure, but really a lot of research is showing us that it's less about peer pressure than it is about peer presence. Just being in the presence of your peers, just the natural desire to be, be like them, be accepted. So that's a very important piece of this. 
Um, but other things like the pressure to excel, um, wanting to, you know, make your parents proud, whatever, be, you know, show your friends that you can, that you can succeed in your, in your, um, the skills that you have in a certain sport, but injuries can also put someone at risk. So especially when we talk about concussion, teenagers who have suffered a concussion or other traumatic brain injury can be up to four times more likely to misuse substances. Um, this is just something that has a lot of research behind it. And we know that um, any kind of head injury can put someone at greater risk. We see this after even car accidents and things like that. Something to be aware of. Um, also found that adolescent athletes might be susceptible to um, some of the things we mentioned, binge drinking, tobacco use, um, drinking alcohol at all, and of course, performance enhancing drugs. And we also need to mention that um, if someone has an injury, then um, are prescribed a painkiller such as um, Oxycontin or Percocet or um, some of these, you know, quote unquote painkillers, they've lost their natural high. Now they're on the bench. They're not performing any longer. They're not practicing with the team and all of that. They've lost some of that connection. Now they're given a highly addictive substance. So just a little bit of a, a, a cautionary note here that if someone has an injury, they might be very much vulnerable to picking up substances and having problems with them. Not everyone who's prescribed these things is going to have a lifelong problem, but unfortunately roughly you know, could be 10, 15% of folks will have some problems with that. So be very careful. When we talk about survivors, this is just a term that we're using for people who have some of these challenges. It could be a mental health diagnosis. Uh, it could be um, PTSD for based on a variety of things, whether it's systemic or, um, or incidental. Um, it could be learning differences. Uh, environmental stresses, grief and loss, you know, these are all things that might um, really challenge folks as they move through life. And some terms that might be helpful to note are comorbidity, which is when we have multiple disorders happening in one person simultaneously. So they might have already had um, a diagnosis, let's say of ADHD, and now they've experienced a trauma. So there would be some comorbid um, challenges that are happening. Dual diagnosis is um, a very similar term, but it's really referring more to one of those kinds of mental health diagnoses um, or um, also in, in concert with a substance use problem. So now there is um, the, the comorbidity or the, the, the dual action of the substance use and a pre-existing condition that maybe wasn't even diagnosed. And of course, there's always that question of which came first. And the people will wonder like, well, is this actually depression or is it because they're drinking a lot? Is this really anxiety or is it because they're using a lot of cannabis and they're feeling anxious because maybe they stopped using it and they're detoxing. There are a lot of different ways that mental health um, can, it can look like a mental health problem, but it's actually substances or it can look like substance use, but it's actually a mental health problem. So when we look at which came first, the reality is we need to treat them simultaneously. Um, they, when, when the problems arise, they need to be addressed um, all together. So um, we know that adolescents um, and substance use disorders go together a lot, you know, when with mental health challenges, um, more than 60% of adolescents in community-based substance use disorder treatment programs also meet criteria for another mental health challenge. Um, and again, as I said, treating them together. And I was curious about this when we were working on a program that's specifically about cannabis use. And I wanted to share this with you because um, we have an entire program just about cannabis use and anxiety, because this has become a very, um, a very prominent challenge for our young people. We know this because we hear from parents consistently that they're struggling with their child being very dependent on cannabis. And so I reached out to um, a, a colleague of ours named Dave Rodenberg. He's the chief clinical officer at Karen Treatment Center, which is a large um, addiction treatment center in central Pennsylvania, it's actually in Reading, PA. Um, but he was telling me that 45% of their admissions for adolescents and young adults, meaning any patients under 25, identify cannabis as their primary or secondary substance. 
Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is of that population, 90%, um, oh, I'm sorry, 90% are also identifying that they use it, whether it's, whether their main drug is alcohol and something else, but 90% of those patients are identifying cannabis use. Here's the important part. They've seen a 10 to 15% increase in hospitalization for cannabis induced psychosis. So I could talk quite a long time about this, but it's really important to know that if there's a family history of, um, of psychosis, of schizophrenia, of certain other um, disorders, to be very wary of cannabis use because we don't know yet for sure if it's correlation or causation. The reality is though, that they are at greater use if they're using cannabis in concert with some of these genetic um, risk factors. It can be a bit of a catalyst, cannabis can. So please be wary of that. And if you'd like more information about that, I can certainly share that later on. I think this is so important. And, and I'll just share a little personally. I mentioned that I have a son in recovery. I also have a daughter um, who um, does not have a history with substance use, but she does have um, a number of mental health diagnoses. And one of them is Tourette syndrome. And we experienced this where she became her own label. She just, she just decided I am this person with Tourette's. It is, it was really challenging for her when she was 13, 14, 15. And that is not the best time of life for a lot of us. And to have some, a disorder, if you're not familiar with Tourette's, she had tics, she had some vocalization that came with that. So she was bullied quite a bit. Um, when she was in middle school. And when she entered high school, she really wanted to self-disclose to her classmates so they understood why she might be behaving differently. But what became a concern for her dad and me was um, it seemed to be consuming her in that she lost her own identity. So when we talk about mental health disorders, my goodness, it's so important to understand that they, that they exist that, that it's um, not necessarily a cross to bear. It's something that can be managed and treated as has my daughter's now 30 and thriving. Um, but you know, we know that it can be really tempting almost to wear it as a badge. And so we wanna just be cautious that we don't go too far into that identifying with that diagnosis. You are a human being who has this disorder, who has um, this diagnosis that can be treated and can be managed. Um, and when we talk about labels, um, I think that this is just such an interesting thing about how we, maybe young people would like to be identified in a certain way. And we can help them with that to help discover their identity. But I think it can be also that slippery slope, as I mentioned, with too much focus on the label. And some of these can be a challenge. If you, if somebody's been told that they're gorgeous their whole life, what happens if they're not feeling gorgeous today? Or, you know, I was told how shy I was when I was a kid. So then I felt embarrassed if I was being louder than usual because, oh, I've got that label of being shy. Um, and I especially find the SMART label very interested because there was um, a really interesting study done by um, Carol Dweck. She's now at Stanford, but she took a group of um, uh, students and they, they, two groups of students, and they were, I think, fifth graders, and they're put in two different groups. They were given the same test. It was a relatively simple test, um, but the group A, they told, you all did very well. You must be really smart. Group B, they told, you all did really well. You must have worked really hard. And then they gave each group an opportunity to take the test again, but they didn't have to. Group A, the majority of those students said, nope, I'm good. I got my label of being smart. I don't want to tarnish that. They didn't say all those words. I'm uh, editorializing a bit there. Group B said, I'll take that test again. And I think that's encouraging to know if we, if we recognize how hard kids work, that it's encouraging to them, that it's motivating to them. If we label them, there's that pressure that like, I don't want to let go of that label. You think I'm this way. So that's how I'm going to, get it. I'm going to roll with that. Oh, social media. This is not the enemy. It's here to stay. It's not going away, but it can be a challenge. It's a challenge for young people. It's a challenge for us, those of us who care about young people. Some of us, it's a challenge just in general dealing with it um, and the pressure that even adults feel. But imagine what it's like for kids. Most kids have a smartphone of some kind 
And um, most kids use at least one major platform. These are the platforms that are most often used. Um, YouTube is the most frequently used. Um, they, for some reason, there's another survey that was done. They didn't include YouTube in this survey, but they talked about which were their favorites. 34% said that Snapchat was their favorite, then TikTok, then Instagram. Um, Twitter and Facebook were far behind in that, in that um, group of students who was asked. <clears throat> Instagram, you may remember the articles that came out several months ago saying that Facebook, which owns Instagram, was well aware that kids were being challenged by their, their self-esteem was being challenged, and yet they made the decision to capitalize on that and really pushed kids to, you know, go further into this, you know, this posting of their identity, their branding, but kids are expressing feelings of depression, low self-esteem, um, body dysmorphia, body dissatisfaction. Um, and of course, how can there not be a high degree of social comparison? This is, this is just ever present these days. And there were, two uh, surveys that were taken, found these online. And I thought this was so interesting. These were surveys of high school students, basically asking them what they want to do when they finish you know, uh, school and go on into their careers. Um, and boy, have things changed. Uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just very interesting. Um, I think I, I would have a hard time understanding exactly what a YouTuber does for a living, but I guess there's some, there's definitely some interest in that among our young people. So how things have changed and how influencer, what does that mean? That is quite a loaded label right there just to be an influencer. Think of the pressure again to um, have a certain persona, brand yourself, market yourself almost, your, your person, not even your, your cause that you're interested in, but you as a person. <clears throat> so as parents, what are some things that we can do to be supportive and not just parents, guardians, teachers, coaches, and mentors, what can we do to support young people? Well, if you are parenting someone, you know, connecting with them, of course, is so important and it doesn't have to be about the big, heavy things. Hopefully we can keep it light, have some fun, maybe, um, maybe practice some yoga, maybe get outside, but even just modeling for them what are some things that we can do to show them how to um, soothe ourselves when we're stressed. You know, just as we often talk about coping skills, like, like taking a walk when we're stressed and have had too much screen time, we can also handle uh, a kind of model ways that we handle um, embarrassments or disappointments. So if we've taken on too much, we can say, I need to be kinder to myself. Or um, if we're playing sports with them, like if we lose, take that really well, instead of feeling, you know, like we need to prove something to someone, you know, our behaviors are setting the bar for our kids a lot of the time. And even if we've made mistakes, we all do, maybe we acted unfairly with a friend or a spouse, or even with one of our kids. And maybe we posted something on social media that we regret. Um, when our kids see us apologize, apologizing for our mistakes becomes normal. Um, when they see us make amends with someone, they learn that it's normal to be accountable for our behavior and um, that we can all learn from our mistakes. And, you know, in teaching our kids about perspective, about, you know, what's important today may not be important 10 years from now, right? And, uh, you know, this, this idea of a snowplow parent, I'm sure many of you have heard this term now, we all know what helicopter parents are, who are hovering and heavily involved in our kids' lives. Well, snowplow parents, you know, we don't want to see our kids in pain. If we see our child um, struggling or hurting or deeply disappointed, we want to make things easier for them sometimes and kind of robbing them of an opportunity to grow um, or, or to learn from these things. So, um, you know, I can absolutely own up to some of this. I didn't want to see my kids suffer. You know, I didn't, they both had challenges growing up. So I thought, well, pick your battles, right? Do they really need to make their bed? Yeah, they do. You know, they can handle that. And if their paper needs to be handed in tomorrow and they haven't started it. They need to be accountable for that too. Um, because unfortunately they're going to need to pre be prepared for that in life as well. 
And I've always loved this since I heard it years ago. I was attending, as I as I have for the last 12 years, um, parent support group meetings to help me with understanding my role as a parent of someone who has a substance use disorder. Um, but this dad said this, and I just loved it. I was playing my movie on my son's screen. And I think this gets back to that, the identity piece, because um, when we identify them at, at the, in, through our eyes, we're kind of, um, you know, putting our expectations on them, right? So we all have hopes and dreams from our kids. It's natural for us to be influenced by our own stories. So if I loved being in school activities, wouldn't our, my kids love that too? Or, or maybe we regretted missing out on something like the athleticism or, or like the popularity or whatever it is. And we want our kids to have what we didn't have. That's not a bad thing. You're, you love your kids. You want them to be happy, but they're not us. They're a whole different individual and we got to respect that and recognize it. Um, so yeah, love that one. And if we're struggling as parents, as guardians, as mentors of kids with our child's identity, with some of the challenges that they're having, we need to get help for ourselves too. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of asking for help with count, professional counselors, therapists, and so on. We have a couple with us tonight. Um, Sarah and Kate are both with us who have this background and Sarah obviously with the district, but Kate's gonna be talking with you next. So um, I really want to encourage you to take care of yourselves. This is not easy, not an easy job. My hat is off to every educator, every parent, and every student. You guys, this is unprecedented times that we're living in, and you guys are amazing. So um, I, I'm just so happy that we can talk about these kinds of subjects. And I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Kate Roberts, if you would like to jump in and get us going. Thanks, Kate. Can you introduce yourself, Kate, and just give a little bit of your background yeah, as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kate Roberts. I am a therapist in the greater Philadelphia area. I'm in private practice. I specialize in LGBTQ affirmative therapy. I work mostly with the queer community, um, college-age students, and substance use. Um, I've worked in the substance use field for 16 years now. Um, <clears throat> and I absolutely love it. And I love that we're talking about this tonight. Um, what I'm going to talk about for the next, you know, few minutes is the thing that I know best, which is the LGBTQ part of it. Um, because that's kind of, that's the one I know best. That's the one I'm a part of the most. Um, so I'm going to expand a little bit on what Kim was talking about. Um, What's really cool, and Kim touched on this, is that there's this really positive and magical thing happening, um, specifically with Gen Zers, in regards to their exploration and definition of queer identities. Um, this is the first generation, really, where queer people are being mirrored to them in media. Um, there's a lot of positive messages happening. They're the first generation where marriage equality has been a thing for a really long time for them even before they probably remembered. Um, <clears throat> so they're really the first generation that has had the space and the opportunity to explore their sexuality and their gender. Um, you know, not just alone, but with all of their peers at school, like in family, everything like that. So, um, which, you know, other generations, that, that wasn't always the case. There was usually an assumption or an expectation set on, you know, older generations, including millennials, I'm a millennial of, um, you know, you're, it's assumed that you're going to be straight. It's assumed that I'm going to marry a man. Right. Um, but this generation, they're like, no, no, you know, they have other, other plans in mind. Um, so it's, it's really been kind of cool to, to recognize that there's this like boom in celebration, um, especially from peer to peer. Um, Kind of claiming and exploring these identities, it um, it fulfills that like age old time of like we all need to become a part of, right? Um, that has been forever. Humans need to feel a part of. They need the fulfillment um, of being a part of an identity, being a part of a group. Um, it brings like security, empowerment, shared values, all of that stuff. And LGBTQ kids, same thing. Um, just want to be a part of and. This is the cool thing about these identities that they're really healthy 
and the community can be really strong. Um, and just to be able to witness, you know, uh, kids these days kind of being able to have these conversations. Um, I have a niece and I started talking to her about sexuality and gender when she was like five or six, she's 11 now. And every time I see her, she, she comes running to tell me like, Oh, you know, this is my friend and, and they use they, them pronouns and like all of these things. And I'm like, what? I didn't have that growing up, you know? Um, so this is awesome. And she's telling me, you know, how, what her sexuality is. And she's telling me what her gender identity is. And um, I'm always out of, she's always calling me old and out of date because my terms are always wrong. Even though I study this and I work with this every day, I'm always wrong. Um, but it's really been a cool experience to witness that. With that being said, there's a darker side to all of this as well. You know, though the messages that queer folks are, are receiving are, are more positive today, um, that's really only been true for the last few years. Um, and Kim kind of showed the stats on, on how it's changed, right? Um, and there's even more stats on suicidality um, that's connected with substance use. Um, our last political administration, the substance use and the suicidality among queer kids specifically skyrocketed through the roof. Um, another thing is, is that kids have access to information 24 seven, right? Like we were talking about with social media, they have smartphones, news is always on, Every, they're constantly digesting messages. And though some of them are positive, society still continues to push these heteronormative ideals. Um, so they're constantly getting confused and battled in, in each and every way. Um, Kim, I love how you also put up the easy bake oven. I had an easy bake oven. I had the Barbie dolls, but my parents were cool. Cause I also had GI Joe, you know, I had rollerblades. I had all that stuff too. Um, but you know, toys, clothing, Disney movies, all still very gendered, very heteronormative. So they do get these confusing messages quite often. Um, and like I said, with, with, you know, the last administration, it was bringing an uprising within schools, right? Um, different laws were being passed that they were witnessing and had to be a part of, right, in schools. Um, you know, families were getting torn apart. So they were seeing all of this, right? And they were absorbing all of this. Um, and even with the positive messages, even if the kid gets one negative one, that's the one they're focusing on. Um, you know, it's kind of like, even as a, as an adult, you know, if you have a review with your boss and they say 15 wonderful things that you've done this past year, and then they give you one like negative critique, you go home and you're obsessing about the negative critique. Right. Um, and I know that people grow out of that as they get older, but especially with kids, like their brain isn't fully developed. They're really focusing on that negative message. They're really focusing on what's safe and what's not safe. So all of these things are, are still pushing kids to have that consistent toxic shame, right? Internalized messages turn into internalized homophobia, transphobia, toxic shame, complex PTSD, complex trauma. And all of this is building on top of it and they're looking for that escape, right? More often than not, they're turning towards substance use, um, eating disorders, self-harm, anything like that to get out of themselves. Um, and that's been kind of the theme that, that we've seen. So it's this idea of death by a thousand cuts, right? Every little microaggression that a kid experiences is another little cut in their arm. And what I mean by that is, let's say they get misgendered or somebody uses their wrong pronouns. It might not seem like a really big overt thing, but it's those little tiny covert things that they're experiencing every day that's just cut after cut after cut, right? Until there's nothing left there. The wound is so deep. Um, so that's why there's such a high risk for substance use disorders within this population. So with all that being said, what do we do about it, right? How as adults, as educators, as coaches, as mentors, as parents, as friends, like how can we support these kids to help kind of battle those negative messages that they're getting? Um, and basically, 
the biggest thing that I always say is have the conversations, have the conversations, have the conversations, right? Explain what sexuality and gender identity is. You know, ask kiddos what their pronouns are. Ask them, what are your friends' pronouns, right? Um, talk about self-love, self-celebration, not just self-acceptance, true self-celebration, right? Um, remind them that their identity is always celebrated in this family, in this classroom, in this group. Um, exposing them to different media or characters that are queer, that have like queer positive stories, you know? Um, helping them find community, really important, whether that be within school programs or um, the LGBT center quite often has youth programs or young adult programs. Um, all of this is like really simple and really important to do. So I'm always saying, have the conversations, have the conversations. If you don't know what to say, educate yourself, talk to people, show up to things like these, right? And there's always a big question too of, well, when do you start having these conversations, right? Um, and if you think about it, um, heterosexuality is kind of in your face from day one, right? Um, constantly being exposed to it at an extremely young age. You know, again, with, with movies, there's love stories, right? And it's the guy and the girl. Um, you know, there's young kids being told, oh, do you have a boyfriend yet? Do you have a girlfriend? Things like that. So really at any age, the younger, the better. As soon as we can normalize these identities, right? As soon as we can learn to embrace and celebrate them, the way better off they're going to be. It really only takes one adult that's consistent, right? That shows up, that listens, that makes an effort to see and hear that kid. It's just one adult. They have a way better shot at a, like a better mental health outcome, at less substance use, right? So just showing up, being present, having the conversations, asking the questions, um, that's really the best thing um, that you can do. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, identities, these sexual sexuality labels, these gender identity labels, they're really important and kids really grab onto them. Um, but what I've seen um, recently is there is a big pressure from peers to choose a label, right? Choose an identity um, because it's like such a bigger thing and people are talking about it. It's wonderful, but, but they are getting pressure to, to choose and remind these kids that are confused or don't know that it's okay to not know. You know, I've had to say that to kids that you don't have to label it, you know, and really normalize that. Um, that's a really important conversation to have with them too. Um, because again, it's like they want to fit themselves into these boxes. And it's like, hey, we don't even have to have boxes. You know, that's the cool thing about being LGBTQ. There's no rules here, you know. Um, and so it can be really validating and, and normalizing to offer that too. Um, so I think I'll, I think I should pause, pause there. Um, and, you know, we can get to questions and stuff later. So. And whoever else is up next, go for it. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. That was really awesome. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, Sarah Brooks, you're up next. <laughs> and please, by the way, I put it in the chat, but please feel free to ask questions, guys, in the chat, Q&A, and we'll get to them as soon as we're all finished here. Go ahead. Um, I have so many thoughts off of what we've already discussed this evening. So I'm going to try and be as linear and succinct as possible. And for those of you who know me well, that may sometimes be a challenge at 740 on a rainy Tuesday night. I think it's Tuesday. Um, my name is Sarah Brooks. I am fortunate to work with student assistance services in the Downingtown Area School District, as well as many of our wellness committees uh, that Dr. Sinelli and I chair and co-chair, and I don't know what all. Um, but I will say I've also been fortunate to work within the district uh, for probably, well, it's over 10 years at this point in time. Um, prior to coming into public education, I actually worked as an adolescent therapist who really worked primarily with mental health and substance abuse at the IOP level of care, as well as outpatient. And then when I came into the school setting, I was really working very closely with our SAP programs, which is student assistance programs. Um, and then since that time, my role has shifted a little bit, but I still work very closely with our prevention specialists and I can share a little bit about the work they do and, and what supports we try and provide. 
Um, but I guess there are a number of thoughts that come to my mind as I was listening this evening. Um, first and foremost, actually, and I don't know if Beth Ann will speak to this at some point, but I do want to give kind of a shout out for a podcast that CTC recently aired. And I, I say that because I think a lot of the things that Kim touched upon early on um, in terms of even some statistical information and things of that nature, especially related to prevalence rates of mental health and substance abuse concerns, especially in the LGBTQ population, those were definitely highlighted in that podcast. So if you haven't had a chance, I would definitely give it a listen. And the other thing that I'll say uh, before I continue down my spiel is, is also, you know, there's some really consistent themes for anyone who is a parent in the district and has attended some of the other presentations that we've been fortunate to host this year. Um, and so I think about some of the things that we've been talking about within the community just recently, even, you know, the documentary we, we showed Chasing Childhood and really trying to, to give our kids back some just independent play so that they can develop some skills towards resiliency and, and grit. And I think a lot of these things are very related, um, especially even as, as Kate was just talking about having conversations and difficult conversations and creating space and being vulnerable. Those are themes that I think we've consistently talked about throughout the course of the school year. Um, even recently with Carol Rothera um, speaking to a group of some of our elementary parents. Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, but, you know, some of the other things that come to my mind as I was listening tonight, and I will say, you know, I was fortunate yesterday, I was sitting in a professional development session. Um, and it was interesting. This is probably actually a teacher that Caleb knows. Uh, but it was funny because we were having a conversation around some of the things that people have learned within the past year or recently professionally. And it was really cool because a, a teacher had commented that through a lot of conversations that he's been part of in professional development and some also conversations within our, our DEI groups, um, he was saying he's really gotten much more attentive to supporting LGBTQ youth, feeling comfortable, feeling like he can engage in conversation so much so that he made a point to say that, you know, where 10 years ago, it would have never occurred to him that when he has parent conferences and he might need to listen to what pronouns the parent uses versus what the student is using. He was like, now it's automatic. Now, when I have a conversation with a parent, I just automatically am like listening and thinking, well, wait, is this, is this how the child has asked to be referenced or identified? Um, is this how I see the student in class? Are these the things that the student has shared with me? And, and really trying to hold sort of some balance in the fact that sometimes to be truthful, kids are, are sharing things with us in school that perhaps they truthfully are not quite ready to share at home. Um, and I will say within my work as a prevention specialist, um, I, I think I've been really fortunate over the years to work with a variety of kids who have a lot of different um, identities, to be truthful. You know, I think back to some of Kim's original slides and when we talk about the high achievers and the athletes and, and things of that nature, I actually worked with a girl years ago who was very high performing, was a cheerleader for all intensive purposes purposes really presented as very perfectionistic and very capable. And I'll never forget one of the things that she had did and done in some of the work we did together. Um, she had done this mask and the front of it was like this beautiful portrayal of what she shows the outside world, right? Gorgeous all together. And on the back side were all of the thoughts and the feelings that she had about herself, many of which were negative, many of which were critical, many of which were really hard to admit to. Um, but it was really pretty profound to see sort of what she was showing the world and then in contrast, what she was feeling internally. Um, and I've been really fortunate over the years to work with a lot of kids, I would say throughout their process of just trying to figure themselves out. Um, that's probably the best way for me to put it. And that's often been kind of related to either mental health things that are out there, diagnoses they've received or have yet to receive, um, addictions that they're trying to figure out, is this a problem or isn't this a problem? I don't really wanna talk about it, but you're gonna ask me some questions and I'm not gonna get in trouble. Maybe I'll talk to you. 
Um, and similarly also LGBTQ youth who have, I've been really fortunate. I've had kids who've come out to me for the first time and we've really been able to have conversations around what the next steps are gonna look like and what it means for them. Um, I feel very blessed in, in all of those sort of experiences that I've been able to share with kids over the years. The, uh, the one piece that stuck out in my mind actually is Kim, you were sharing sort of some different information in the beginning was also just the piece. And I think this is probably my education hack coming in. Um, I do think there's also a relationship between the number of kids who have learning disabilities or undiagnosed learning disabilities or just different learning styles. Um, and I think a lot of times that impacts their sense of self and sometimes shows up later throughout their educational careers and, and might present as either a mental health diagnosis or an addiction diagnosis. But I think there's often sometimes some underlying themes related to how that student is even experiencing school. Um, and some simple things that we sometimes take for granted like reading, um, which is an incredibly complex thing, believe it or not. So anyway, um, but as we talk about resources and supports in Downingtown, uh, what I will say is I referenced our prevention specialists. Um, they are a small group of individuals. They are not our only resources, but there are 10 prevention specialists throughout the school district. Um, at the high school level, we have two, both at Downingtown East and Downingtown West. We have one at STEM. We have one at Lionville Middle School, uh, one at Downingtown Middle School, one at Marsh Creek Center, all thousand sixth grade students attending there. And then we have two who support 10 elementary schools. Um, what I will say in our high school levels in particular are these are individuals who are working very closely with our SAP teams. Um, they are often working with students who are potentially experiencing a variety of different either mental health or substance abuse concerns. They're often trying to not only work individually with that student within the school setting, but potentially trying to support families and, and get connected to resources in the community. And they're really just one piece of the puzzle. Um, that's not to overlook the hard work that many of our school counselors are doing as well. We often work very closely with them. And I would honestly say, you know, when I think about the supports that are available to our students, it's not just our school counselors or our prevention specialists or our school psychologists. I think it's also our school nurses, our administrators, our teachers. There really are a variety of people um, and ways to reach out to get help if you are either a student who's concerned about yourself or a peer or a parent who's trying to find resources. Um, that being said, I also touched briefly upon some of our SAP teams. And our SAP teams actually exist in buildings uh, grades 6 through 12. And so each building has a team of teachers that have been trained in the student assistance model. Um, student assistance at its core is, is not treatment or anything of that nature, but it is designed to support students who potentially are experiencing either emotional or behavioral challenges that are impacting uh, their access to education. And so in some instances, kids may be introduced to SAP and as a result, they might even receive like an assessment and that might indicate the need for some level of counseling or treatment in the community. But in other instances, it may look more like an informal mentoring type program where students have a, a trusted adult. I think somebody, I think Kate had mentioned that earlier, just the value of a trusted adult, which I think we come back to often. It just takes one person. Um, and so that, that program really is designed to help support students and partner students um, with teachers who have some understanding. They're obviously not the replacement for counselors or therapists, but they can be a great resource for students in navigating their school day um, and a great sounding board and, and helping to kind of advocate for that individual. Um, and then beyond that, I would also say we have a number of different clubs and activities that students get, can get involved with. Um, over the years, programs like Avitum, um, I don't know if Kayla will speak to that, but we actually do have an Avitum program, which is really focused largely on, on mental health awareness. Um, they have the slogan of, I got your back as well as Beth Ann can speak to our hype clubs, but that is healthy youth, positive energy. That is also in many of our buildings and trying to support students in making positive decision-making skills and healthy coping skills. Several of our buildings also have GSA programs. Um, so there really are a number of resources. Now I say that, and do I think we have enough? No, <laughs> um, I'm not sure what questions have so far come in the chat, um, but I'm very aware. And I think our group 
has really tried to also stay connected with what resources are available in the community. Um, we're consistently trying to stay informed with what either support groups are out there, counseling groups, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, levels of care, you name it. Um, I will be honest, in some places, it's easier to get access to care than others. And we are acutely aware of that. But I would say that is probably the short version or an overview of the number of resources that we have in the community. Um, I will also say in full transparency, I think our website is scheduled. Don't quote me or hold me to this. I think our district website is actually scheduled to be updated next school year. I mentioned that only because before we started, we were joking that sometimes it is challenging for people to find what they're looking for on the website. Um, there are certain things that are specific to buildings. So, for example, when you look at STEM's website, for example, there is a specific link to their counseling department and then a number of resources there within. Uh, the same thing I would say for East and West and many of our other buildings. Um, if you look on the Downingtown Area School District district website, there are also links that can connect you to safety and wellness, as well as pupil services. And in many of those pages, you will also find listings for some of the prevention specialists, as well as on their building assignments. So I hope that was a helpful piece of information. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much, uh, but if there are questions I can answer, feel free to let me know or we can continue to move forward. Awesome. That was fabulous, Sarah. And before we move on to Kayla, I do wanna ask you this question that just came in since we are, you're fresh on the resources. The landing zone at school is a great concept, but with several kids in the room, it can be overwhelming at times. Are there other options where a student, maybe you can explain what the landing zone is. Are there other options where a student can go to de decompress or take a needed break? I might need some clarification on the landing zone as well. Um, I will tell you both of our high schools at this point in time, it's interesting, Downingtown East, um, created a space within their counseling department. It, it's an office suite that they basically transitioned into a space where that students could access at any given point throughout the course of the day. Um, it's got a lovely environment, I will tell you. It's very serene. It's very peaceful. There's all kinds of activities you can do, kind of hands-on things. I think they typically have some quiet music playing. They have... Um, just a lot of cool stuff. It is also closely monitored, I will say that. And then Downingtown West actually recently created a very similar space um, that I think is primarily being used at this point in time um, for students who are actually returning to the building from some type of a treatment experience and, and are kind of having a hard time getting back into the routine of all of their academic classes. Um, I was fortunate to see that space not long ago. I will say it is also a very peaceful and comforting place to attend. Um, so those that are what come to my mind, I'm not sure if somebody had a different idea when they said landing space. Got it. That's <laughs> at West, yes, yeah, yeah, a room at West. And what was the question that was initially asked? Sorry. Um, it seems it can be a little bit overwhelming because there could be several kids in there at a time. So are there other options where a student can go to decompress and you, you covered that, so. Yeah, I mean, I would say, and I have been in there at times where there have been a couple kids in there, I would say if you have a student who's accessing that room right now and, and is still finding it overwhelming, um, I would probably touch base within the counseling department, even um, like Matt McFadden or Jocelyn White are both the prevention specialists in that building. So if a student is finding that space to be overwhelming, I would encourage a parent to reach out to them. Um, just to see if there are any other additional alternatives. It, it may also somewhat depend upon the student and if there are other resources within their schedule that they could be utilizing. Yep, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, yeah. So I just, I just need to say, like, you know, you, you may not, you may feel like you don't have nearly enough resources. Nobody ever does feel like it, but you guys are between the CTC and everything that you do, Sarah. I mean, SAP is something student assistance programs. I think are so underutilized or people not even underutilized. I don't think many parents even are aware they exist. And, you know, I, as a parent, I can remember having a K through 12, 12 children, you know, and I think that as parents, a lot of times we're hesitant to go to the school with the concern we have about our child, because we want the school to see this bright, shiny student and aren't they great. And we're, you're going to write them really great letter of recommendation. Right. So there's that hesitancy, but please folks know um, after working with these, these amazing, you know, leaders in student services for years, they have your kids back to 
coin your phrase. I mean, they're advocates. They are not trying to be punitive. They're not trying to hold anybody back. They really want to help your kids and how fortunate that you are a district that has these resources. So please do take advantage of them. And thanks for including the, um, in the chat, uh, Chrissy put in the link to everyone for that podcast that Sarah mentioned. So excellent. Thank you for all that. Uh, Kayla, hi, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? Yes, as our alum. Oh, good. Yes, I am the uh, alumnum for this um, presentation. So my name is Kayla Foster. I currently attend Alberta University as a sophomore studying addictions and mental health treatment. So exactly what we're talking about. I graduated in 2020, the beginning of pandemic from downtown STEM Academy. So, um, which is a little different than downtown West and downtown East, but it's still part of the school district. Um, I'm here to talk about a little bit of my experiences in high school and how identity really played a role in not only how I viewed myself, but how others viewed me, whether that was my friends, peers, teachers, even my own parents. Um, so yeah, my struggles began when I was relatively a freshman, um, but really progressed as I was a sophomore. Not only did I struggle with my own sexuality as I identify um, a part of the LGBT community as Kate was talking about earlier, but I also struggled with the expectations that were put on me, not necessarily um, spoken expectations, but more so the expectations I put on myself to not only continue to be a star student, um, I'm very much so a perfectionist, but to maintain my grades, I also was involved with athletics all of my life. So I, I had to keep that up as well. Um, I wanted to be seen as the perfect student, but also perfect kid to my parents. So a lot of that had to do with um, expectations and again, identity. I unfortunately in high school went through a lot um, in and out of treatment programs. I was diagnosed with multiple mental health disorders, but I am now um, grateful for that experience as it's not only taught me that I am not defined by my labels at all, but also I'm not going to let other people um, define me by those labels as I am my own person and I get to choose how I'd like others to view me regardless of their own opinions. I know personally it was um, very much so of a struggle with my parents um, understanding specifically why I had some of these mental health disorders or why I wanted to identify a certain way, but um, I think these learning resources that are available and even just resources um, that Kim Porter is a part of would have been more than beneficial for my parents to even just sit in on a conversation and to understand um, better of what their child was going through. Not saying that my parents weren't supportive, but I feel as though there's so many more resources out there to help parents that maybe their child's going through something similar that I went through. Um, lucky enough for me, I was very fortunate um, through the school district to have lovely supports that were in place and really helped me get through high school, but not only that, graduate high school eventually. And um, yeah, so that's basically an overview, but I feel as though there's a lot of wonderful resources out there that are in place for children that struggled like I did. And um, yeah, I think this is a wonderful conversation to be a part of. So thank you for having me once again. Wow, oh, Kayla, thank you so much for sharing that. It, we're always so um, grateful for the personal experience that people share. Thank you. You're truly important to us and really appreciate your transparency. Thank you very, very much. Um, so if, unless any of the other panelists have anything, I'll start jumping into some of the questions. Does anyone have, um, Beth Ann or Chrissy, do either of you have anything you wanted to share at this time? Okay, good. All right. So um, there was a question that was just asked, how do you speak with your child who's now an adult um, about the bullying they endured as a teenager about their sexuality, but they're still dealing with the effects of the bullying into adulthood? Obviously, we would want to offer them an opportunity to talk with a professional, right? Maybe support that. Okay, do you have any thoughts about that? Kate, 
Kate, are you are you able to hear me? I was just wondering if you wanted to chime in on that one. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm having a, I'm trying to find where the question is because I oh, want to make that sure. One I think, that's, I think, in the Q&A box. So I'll repeat it. How do you speak with your child who's now an adult about the bullying they endured as a teenager about their sexuality, but they're still dealing with the effects of the bullying into their adulthood? Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is a lot of the work that I do is working with those adults who endured a lot of um, bullying in their teenage years surrounding their sexuality, their gender identity, um, and getting into an affirmative therapist is really, I, I think, one of the most helpful tools. Um, validating, validating, validating is also a really helpful tool coming from a parent. Um, you know, just listening to their story. Um, one of the most wonderful things that I ever heard as a young adult who had just come out was when my parents said, you know, I love that you're gay, you know, not just, um, you know, not just, I love you, even though you're gay, right? Or I love you. It's it was just, literally she was my mom was like, I love that you're gay. I love that about you. You seem so much like yourself. And that was one of the most validating experiences that I had had um, when I was still struggling with my sexuality. So validation from, from parents goes a long, long way. Right. And I think there's such, um, for parents, I know this parent is looking for how can she speak with her child, he or she or she speak with her child. Um, but also, you know, we, we parents, and when we see our, again, when we see our child in pain, it's really hard for us. And so sometimes it's hard to accept that I may not be the easiest person for them to talk to about the bullying that they endured, you know, um, as much as I want to help um, just be, to be open, like I'm here for you. Um, I'm going to listen without judgment, anything you need to say, you know, just to have that attitude, um, but to offer them that opportunity to talk to somebody who, who maybe has been where they've been, I think is a beautiful suggestion. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think, that Sarah, this is probably for you. Uh, do any teenagers use the county's access teen chat? Oh, no, it's not you, your account. You're not county, but <laughs> maybe, you know, the, um, there's that teen chat and phone line that the county has. Do you guys know if that's maybe Bethann, you guys know? Is I have the resources in my office at the moment. If you'd like me <laughs> to speak to it. Um, I, and I don't know, Bethann, did you want to chime in or do you want me to just ramble? <laughs> Yeah, just ramble because I know we've talked about this and we're listing it a lot now as an option in our resources. So yeah, well, you can, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'll try and be succinct here as well. The the county, other counties actually, I think Montgomery County may have started it in terms of having a, a teen um, talk line that was available or even a text line that was available. And so that has sort of come into Chester County more recently. And I think they are still in the process of working on getting more teens trained um, kind of as peer mentors or peer supports. But I actually had a conversation um, with one of the women who are working directly with the program on Monday of this week, which was just yesterday, amazingly. And um, she did actually say that, that they have been experiencing that kids have been using it. She felt like, and I actually really appreciated hearing this. She said she felt like kids were really appropriately using it. Um, they do have kind of a partnership and a warm handoff with Valley Creek Crisis, who is our county's crisis resource and provider in the event that someone is experiencing thoughts of suicide or things along those lines. Um, so I think they've created some very clear boundaries and protocols so that if someone is experiencing a mental health emergency, this isn't where they're going to sort of be triaged, that they're very appropriately being serviced by Valley Creek. Um, but it sounded like from what she was sharing that they are trying to sort of build greater awareness around it, greater capacity. But what they've also experienced is that kids are using it and they're using it very appropriately. The individuals who are currently working um, the lines are all obviously trained in, in kind of peer mentoring and things of that nature. Um, and, and so far, it sounds from what feedback we received earlier in the week, it, it feels like it's going pretty smoothly at the moment. So kids have been using it, which is cool. Great to know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
This is such a good question. The, the number of kids struggling with mental health issues seems to be so overwhelming. Is it really as bad as it seems? Uh, my daughter's dealing with grief issues and not her only issue um, due to the suicides. Um, are other kids in the district having the same issues? Sarah, would you like to? I can speak from my experience in the district, although I might ask for some other people to chime in from what they observe either in the county or I, I forget, Kate, if you're in Philadelphia area or what you observe in terms of even just your private practice work. Um, I'm like the wrong person to ask this question to because in full transparency, do I think we are experiencing a, a really significant level of mental health need right now? Yes. Um, anybody who's heard me talk probably has heard me say something in regards to the fact that in the past couple of years, even outside of the pandemic and all of its impact, we are also a school district that's experienced multiple losses by suicide. Um, and the weight of that has definitely stayed with our students and our, and our parents and, and our educators, to be truthful. I think many of our teachers are, are still holding um, feelings of, of loss and sadness. So there is some very real mental health needs um, that are out there. Uh, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that I think we also probably have a number of kids who are doing really well. And there may have been sort of some silver linings takeaways from, from the pandemic. Um, but yeah, we do definitely have a number of kids who are having a hard time. And I know at least, you know, in conversations with my team of prevention specialists, we're often trying to work to support those kids. And, and I will be completely honest when I also say, you know, there's a lot of resources in the county, but there are also a lot of limited resources at the moment. And so, um, you know, having access to things, there are a lot of waiting lists, there are a lot of insurance restrictions or funding restrictions. And I would say, to be truthful, we've also experienced more um, students accessing care, even out of state in some instances, um, more so than we've experienced in the past. And I think somebody touched upon it earlier. I feel like we've also seen more students accessing care for eating disorders than I feel like I've seen in quite some time. So that's probably my slightly skewed and biased perspective, but if anybody wants to jump in from their populations, I would welcome that. I'll just say you're you I know that you're not alone, Sarah, in this because we work with so many clinicians who so are saying the same thing. I think perhaps the silver lining in, in all of this is um, people are talking about mental health a lot more. You know, I mean, if you follow social media at all and you see nothing but posts about this these days, which I think is a great thing. And I think there's that sense of validation that I'm going through a hard time and oh my God, I'm not alone. And there's some great tips. There's some great self-care tips that are in there. There's like, I saw a self-care bingo the other day. Like, have you, can you check off any of these things that you've done for yourself? I mean, uh, there's some really wonderful things happening. And I can't believe I neglected to mention, I just put it in the chat to everyone that we have these support groups for parents who, if you have a, these are specifically for parents, guardians, caregivers who have a child, um, any age child who struggles with substance use. We meet throughout the week. Most of the meetings are on Zoom right now. I always mention at the beginning, somehow I dropped the ball tonight, but um, there's the link. You can find information about these meetings. Access to them is on that website, on that page on our website. So um, they have saved my life these past, you know, 12 years that I've been going to these meetings. It just, they're my people, you know, they get what my, what I've been through and I get what they're going through. So, um, but yeah, unfortunately this is a challenging time right now, but we're all in it together, right? And Kim, I was going to say, I think that, um, and, and my, you know, my, I have adult children at 27 and 24, but I can remember back in their high school years, there was a greater comfort level with talking about mental health um, and talking about many of these things that we're sharing that maybe we didn't, we weren't so comfortable with when we were in high school. But so I do find that that's there. And I find that they're also really good peer support for each other too, which I'm impressed by. Um, and helpful in finding resources and kind of helping each other do the research. So, um, so I think we're seeing that more that, that they're comfortable communicating, they're comfortable sharing, they're comfortable helping each other. Sometimes it's us. I, we just never had that experience. So we kind of struggle with 
what's the best words or the right words or, um, you know, what to say or not to say. Um, and just our comfort level. And as Kate said, the, the conversation piece is critical, no matter how clunky or uncomfortable or whatever that it might be. It, it's just a really important part of this and just sort of getting comfortable, maybe learning what you need to learn about it, but also just being comfortable listening and kind of leaning into it and just going with it um, is extremely helpful because the kids are quite good at it. And I think that's what I we find. I have to agree with what you were saying. I know for myself, while I was in high school with my friend group, I was friends with a lot of people, almost like friends with everyone type of thing. We very much so leaned on one another, not only with our own personal experiences, but just the experience in itself that we're all going through the same thing. Maybe not specifically like mental health diagnoses or athletics or even Mm -hmm. just sexuality, but we're all in high school. We're all doing similar things. It's stressful. It really is figuring out what you want to do with the rest of your life, what you want to study. But um, I think peers, at least today, uh, have been much more accepting of just talking about mental health in general, um, in comparison to uh, generations um, that mm-hmm. you're from and that other Absolutely. adults. So I think that's a very rewarding thing for not only students mm-hmm. who feel alone in their struggles, but um, it's, it's also very comforting to understand that, hey, maybe they struggle with this same thing too. Um, I know some students feel more comfortable talking to their peers versus adults. Um, sometimes adults can just be a little bit more intimidating, um, not saying that they aren't a great resource at all. But um, yeah, I think relying on fellow peers can be a great thing. Just making sure not to rely on them too much though, because adults are there for a reason. Um, so <laughs> you need to know how to balance that out at the end of the day. Good point. I was going to say, and to echo sort of Beth Ann and Kayla's points, and then Chrissy, I'll stop talking. Um, But no, I was going to say, I mean, I think I even hear that from from my staff in terms of, I think there's a definite awareness that the kids are definitely talking to, supporting, taking care of each other. um, And that's a really great thing. Um, But obviously, in certain situations, trying to sort of have some balance in that and make sure that kids are either not and forgive me for using the word kids, um, but the kids aren't either holding more than they should yeah. or more than they mm. need to, because, you know, that, that that's a really hard balance and some really hard skills to develop, to be truthful. I think adults still struggle mm-hmm. with that at times in terms of like, how do I prioritize my needs and still have space for your needs? Mm-hmm. So um, that's like a life lesson right there. But sure. Yeah. So, but I would agree. I, I think we also have some really great kids who are really there for each other. Absolutely. I was just going to say, um, and just to share with, a, if uh, one of our part, other partners that we have as part of our collective is Holly O'Connell with a path to hope. And really what she hones in on is, and what her website is all about is if you're looking for mental health resources, she really breaks down. It can be really overwhelming because you don't know what you don't know. And when you might be, depending what your situation is, Um, I just thought this would fit. It just came to mind just to share and I can, can't multitask, but I'll put it in the chat when I'm done talking, um, her link to all of her resources, but that's about navigating the mental health system and kind of, and she's very open. I'm sure some of you watching have seen her speak before or been to her events. Um, but it's about navigating the system, finding a a good fit for your kid. If they do need, you know, therapy and counseling, um, finding good match, what that looks like insurance, all of those different things. So I just wanted to put a little plug in for her as a partner. Thanks, Chrissy. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, And Kayla, um, you mentioned peers being a big, you know, support for you, but there's a great question if you would asking if you'd be willing to share some of the resources you availed yourself of while you were in high school that helped you to successfully navigate your experience. Yes, no, I did see that question. I was getting to that. Um, So not only were my peers uh, very important in just my journey overall, um, I would definitely have to say, depending on supports that are in place, such as guidance counselors, prevention specialists. I know Sarah personally knows me from those type of things, but um, I know it can be a very scary thing reaching out to those adults that their job is specifically designed to help with those types of situations. It can be very intimidating, scary just to take that first step. But um, I know 
besides just this, I used my peers to not only help me reach that point, but I know at least in my building at the STEM Academy, there was many teachers that were more than willing to not only talk about what specifically what was going on with me, but also to support me throughout the different steps I took, whether that was me coming back from treatment or um, going to actual guidance um, counseling office with me. Uh, many times, I don't think students realize that the teachers are really there for the kids. Um, especially not just academics, but for their personal lives as well, um, to a, a certain extent. So I would encourage um, your child to really reach out to all of their supports around them, not only just the guidance counseling office, but to their peers, but also teachers. Um, I know I had a specific teacher that really just helped. Uh, I know Kate was talking about specifically just that you need one person to really help you move forward in that support and a listening ear. And that individual was very much so key to my success and to getting better and being in recovery now as I am. Uh, we thank, thank you for that, Kayla. Thanks a lot. Um, we had an advanced question that was asking about LGBTQ facilities that can handle high functioning autism or Asperger's. Uh, this is for a 24 year old and they're not having, they're having a hard time finding the right fit. Kate, are you aware of any resources for this population in particular? Um, <clears throat> I'd have to kind of go through my list. The first one that's popping up in my mind, which is one of my favorites. It's really small. Um, it's called Elevate. Um, and it's in Asheville, North Carolina. I can put their website in the chat. Um, they're really small, absolutely incredible. Um, and they work with, you know, the population that you were just discussing. So um, I'll put that in and then they can, they can kind of check that out. Great. And, and while we have you, Kate, would you mind saying something about PFLAG? I think that might be an interesting resource for parents or, or if there are others that you're aware of as well. Absolutely. Um, PFLAG is really great. Um, <clears throat> and they have a bunch of different chapters in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, <clears throat> they have meetings for its parents and it's an old title, but it's parents and friends of lesbians and gays, right? Um, that's what PFLAG stands for, but they have groups. It's a free resource. Um, they have groups for parents, for caregivers, for guardians. Um, they have different groups for siblings. They have different meetups for, um, you know, the queer community. Um, but PFLAG is, is a really awesome resource. And they're really, this one in Philly is really connected to all the, the, the resources needed within the area. Um, another one is <clears throat> the Mazzoni Center and um, William Way, both which are in the city. Um, really awesome places. They have a lot of resources specifically for the queer community and most of it's free. Um, so again, I can put all of this in the chat if that's helpful. Perfect. That would be great. And then I'll add them to that follow-up page, which will be updated by the morning. By tomorrow, we'll have that updated with some of these resources in this recording. Um, we had a couple of questions about if they're about parents who from parents whose children they feel are with friends that they're not really approving of. The parents feel aren't aren't a good fit for their kids. They're maybe, you know just have different values than the parents would like their kids to have and things like that. And this does come up and it does probably, it does relate to identity. I believe for some kids too, they want to belong to a certain, you know, peer group or something like that. And I just wanted to ask the group, if you have any thoughts about this, about, you know, how parents can navigate this and well, I'll, I'll I want to see what you guys have to say about that. Um, if we could just, pick everything for our children, life would be so much simpler, right? You're gonna, we're gonna set up your play, dates, play dates for the rest of your life. <laughs> we're going to control, control, control the situation, but we can't always do that. And what happens when you say, like my mother told me, I don't like that girl, so-and-so, 
guess what? She's my best friend and you can forget about me ever telling you that I'm spending time with her again, right? Sarah, were you going to say something? Well, I was, and then I'm going to defer to some other people who have, Beth Ann's going to talk about having adult children. And I'd say that because I think she will say that. And I appreciate that perspective and I'm grateful. Um, no, it's funny because I'm laughing as I'm thinking about, again, the, the Chasing Childhood documentary, because, you know, that one really kind of actually indicated that we need to let go a little bit. <laughs> um, now I say that and on the flip side, and as it pertains in particular, I'm, I'm kind of thinking more along the lines of substance abuse and things of that nature. You know, I, I know in my experience in particular, working with adolescents, I'm not sure how many times I've said to a parent, you know, do you know your, your kid's friends or do you know your kid's friend's parents? And the response is like, no. Um, and I think that's happened by the virtue of a number of things, to be truthful. And I don't know if there's one thing that we can pinpoint or blame that on. I think it's gotten really hard with access to social media. And let's be honest, our kids get phones really young. And with that comes a level of independence that we probably either aren't always prepared for, or maybe haven't always purposefully had conversations about um, in terms of like, hey, when I when you are going to somebody's house, I need to talk to that parent first, or I would like to know who that is, or why don't you have your friends come over? Um, so I think those are some of the things that immediately come to my mind. I know that doesn't really answer the question. I think what I would say is, you know, I, I think the kids that I've known that have really sort of struggled with substance abuse issues at some point in their high school careers, a, a lot of times parents have been able to reflect or, or sort of identify a shift in peer groups or a shift in friendships and kind of a loss of control. Um, that has probably influenced some of that a little bit. And it's really hard. And, and there's also a piece of me that kind of comes back to the place of, you know, we've talked a lot in this session and others about having open space and conversations with your kids and starting those discussions like young. Um, Kate said that earlier in regards to, to gender and identity, but it's also in regards to drugs and alcohol and any number of other things. Um, and then I'll stop talking and Bethann, if you want to share any words of wisdom. Ah, it's a hard one, right? I survived and my kids survived. Um, but I think this is a really difficult one because um, I think the conversation piece is critical and knowing who you're, and I was that mom who, you know, called parents, knew the kid, all of those things, right? All those little checklist things that you try to do. But I always had conversations with the kids about knowing your values and no, being your authentic self and aligning yourself with people that that was, you know, not just trying to like be with a friend group because you thought that there was something you know, for the wrong reasons, perhaps, you know, for and it wasn't really you. And I think that kids then get that conflict with if it goes against their family values and your family values are clearly stated. Parents have explained that you live it. Kids hear it. and They see it. Um, they know when there's that conflict between that and what friend group they're sort of gravitating towards. Um, and they may make those mistakes and you, you know, you can't guarantee. And as Sarah said, I think the challenge that I didn't have to live with is that we didn't have cell phones. My kids still, you know, cell phones didn't come in until pretty much their high school years and they weren't really smartphones yet. So that, that friend group piece is really critical because a lot happens behind that screen. And that's a challenge that I don't really have an answer for of, of how do you control that? Because you're not, if you're worried, that a lot remains a mystery to you. And it's a really difficult thing to get to. Um, it's not the same as seeing who they're with or watching and observing and those things. So I have to say, that's a variable that I, I didn't have a lot of experience with, but lots of conversations when I was concerned, you know, lots of conversations about their values, being authentic. How does it make them feel when they're with that group? All of those things help. But I do have to say, Sarah, you brought up a really good point about the social media thing that um, is, it would be a struggle for me today. I'd have to say, even then, even if I used all my best detective skills, of which I was quite good at, I don't even know if I could get to the bottom of some of that today. Yeah, it's challenging. Thanks, Beth Ann. I appreciate that. Um, so I, we are just five minutes left in the program, and there are a couple more questions, but I think this one is a good one that encapsulates this topic. 
Um, and I think when they say you, they're talking about the district. Are you encouraging or cautioning tween slash teenagers about finding their identity at their age? Do you see a downside of labeling? So who would like to talk about that? And I'd like to know what Kate and Kayla think about this too, about, about encouraging tween and teenagers to find their identity. Like, what does that mean to you guys? I'll go there and then I'll hand it off. Um, it's a hard one to answer. And I, I think the hat that I'm going to wear to answer that is, is probably closely connected to the work that a lot of the prevention spe specialists do. And, and what I would say is, you know, in those conversations, I, I think we're just really holding space, to be honest with you. Um, I forget what some of the language in the beginning of the question was around either like cautioning or encouraging. You know, I, I think within our offices, we're often just trying to create space for kids to feel comfortable to talk and to share. And so wherever that conversation goes, it goes. Um, and I think even Kate kind of referenced earlier in, in her presentation, just some aspects of being able to ask questions, being able to sort of listen for answers you know, always sort of trying to come at things from a perspective of not being judgmental um, and just being a resource and an ally for our kids. I, I think that's largely the work that the prevention specialists do um, and probably what I'm best equipped to speak to, but certainly, Kelly, you went through the district. I don't know if you have thoughts on what your experience was or if anybody else has feedback. I, okay, I would definitely say that um, we have to remember that we're still growing up. So it's, it's natural to find our own identities and it's natural for our identities to shift and change as we go through new things. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise someone to stick to a certain label or to label their own children as something as though that can be pressure inducing and can create more anxiety and just um, perfectionism. But I would definitely have to say that you have to realize that your kid is going to grow up into who they want to be and maybe not necessarily living your own life through your child, but um, continuing to be a support, a listener, um, understanding that identities can shift and it's okay to have multiple identities as long as we're not taking the label and defining that person for one specific thing that maybe we disagree with or don't like as much. Um, again, I just think being more of a support um, and it's totally okay to voice your own opinions on things as long as you can be respectful for your child and respectful towards what they are um, going for. I love that. Respectful is such an important piece of this, isn't it? Uh... Kate, go ahead. I mean, <clears throat> Kayla just nailed it. Um, totally nailed it. I, I fully agree with you on that. And, and the languaging of encouraging versus cautioning. I don't really like cautioning. I don't like necessarily like that word in terms of identity. And, and it is going to shift. And I know that a lot of specifically, I've, I've experienced a lot of parents getting frustrated, right? With, well, they're, they're saying they're this now and then they're that. And, and you know what um that's part of identity development in general at that age at the tween teenage years they're supposed to be confused right they're supposed to be asking questions trying to figure stuff out shifting left and right or it's staying the same so encouraging wherever they're at right now is what i would say um, that's all i wanted to add that was great Oh, man. I was just going to say as a person listening to everything, like and as a parent who will be there eventually um, with my younger kids um, is just the value in kind of uh, the same thing. Like assume just maybe we should all reset our expectations and just be like, they're going to be, there's no straight line. It's a very squiggly line. And you just say, okay, tell me more. Hmm. It's, it's the weight again. Right. I just, this is, I, I'm going to have to like get it tattooed somewhere. Like just wait. Why am I talking? And just, oh, hmm, tell me more. Well, that's interesting. Okay. All right. Um, so just maybe those kind of keep those touch points in mind and just expect there will be a lot of change and try to give yourself some like deep breaths and patience to just like ride it out and, and kind of go along with it and, and as supportive and validating as you can. 
Yeah. What a great conversation. I really want to thank you all. Um, I don't know, Chrissy or Bethann, if you want to take us out. Um, any last minute announcements you want to make? Um, thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. And to our friends who joined us tonight, the panelists and stuff, it was, it was a great conversation and certainly wish we, I think we just need to have more of these opportunities um, and these conversations. And as Chrissy and Sarah, Kim, you mentioned there's been a number of these presentations throughout the school year on topics of how to have tough conversations, how to communicate with your child, um, mental health conversations, substance use conversations, you know, podcasts, there's so much out there. Um, and sometimes it's just really hard to sort through all of that, but we hope that we're, we're bringing, you know, we think we're bringing to our community what we're hearing are the concerns, you know, what's been happening these last couple of years. So we're gonna continue to do that through our parent speaker programs, working with our partners, the school district programs, um, our podcasts, whatever it is that we find we're you know, happy to share. And please also to those of you that are still listening this evening, if you have thoughts, I mean, we're also looking for feedback. So if you're you know, in the school district, a parent in the school district um, that you would, you know, you have some things you'd like us to consider, please let us know, you know, reach out to any of us. Um, so we are making sure that we're designing our programs to really meet your needs. Um, so I just want to say thank you from Communities That Care, and I think for, from the district and, and from Kim with Be a Part of the Conversation, who is a wonderful resource, and we're so excited that we've been able to work with them. Um, and we do have some more, we have a couple more parent programs coming up, um, and we'll make sure we get that information out to you. Um, so on the website for Downingtown Area School District, also on the website for CTC. So thank you. Thanks, Good night, Kim. everybody. Thank you so Good much. Night. Thank you.